Good day. First of all, I should let you all know that I'm making this program in Greece, where I have uh, come for a short visit. I'll be here for a couple of days, uh, where I'll be meeting for the first time for four years, my colleague and friend Alex Christoforou, and we'll be hopefully making programs together. But in the meantime, I would say that connectivity in this part of Athens is not always as good as in London, and I hope that you can all see me and hear me clearly as I make these programs. Well, in light of this, I'm going to do a fairly brief program today, and briefly I'm going to be looking at the military situation in Ukraine. But I'm also going to touch on the Western response to the important summit between Erdogan and Putin in Sochi, which took place a few days ago. So firstly, dealing with the situation on the ground, I think that um, we've seen an intensification of fighting uh, across the entire Ukrainian battlefields, but in spite of some rather breathless commentaries that I saw in some places, both Russian aligned and in some cases even Western aligned, it strikes me that the major fighting, the focus of the fighting, remains firmly in Donbass, and we're getting more reports now that the Russians have now broken further in to uh, uh, are, are cracking even more successfully the Ukrainian defence line, the key defence line running from Siversk in the north to Bakhmut in the south. They're now certainly fighting well within the city pressings of Bakhmut. They've captured, or at least are in the process of capturing, a large factory, an industrial factory outside uh, Soledad. And it increasingly looks as if this entire line is buckling. Now, on the subject of this factory, uh, uh, close to Soledad, the pattern of this fighting in Donbass, as became clear from the famous battle and siege of the Azovstal steelworks, is that these big industrial factories, Soviet-era industrial factories in Donbass, are... Uh, primary areas for fortification by the Ukrainians. The Ukrainians have turned many of these big factories into major fortified centers. We saw that obviously in Mariupol with Azovstal. We saw that with the chemical factory near Severodonetsk. We saw it with another factory area south of Lizichansk, which the Russians captured before they advanced on Lizichansk itself. And, of course, we saw it a short time ago with the Uglogorsk thermal power station, which became also an important linchpin of the Ukrainian defence lines. These factories are built to enormous engineering specifications, heavy engineering specifications. They, they have large, heavy buildings, uh, which can absorb a lot of artillery shelling. They are obvious fortresses, and the Ukrainian defense system in Donbass has heavily relied upon them. Sometimes, as we saw with Mariupol and Severodonetsk, they are the last places in a city to fall. Sometimes, as we saw it with Lizichansk, and as we are now seeing with Bakhmut and um, Soledad, the Russians seek to attack them first before they actually carry out the storming of these cities, the actual street fighting intended to clear these cities. But one way or, in, or another, the capture of these industrial facilities is at least as important as the capture of the towns themselves. And that, by the way, appears to be happening. And perhaps consistent with the fact that the Ukrainians are coming under enormous pressure in Donbass, We've had a rather plaintive broadcast from President Zelensky of Ukraine. He has spoken of very difficult situations for the Ukrainians all across Donbass, in Pesky, in Avdievka, in Marinka, these three places and the heavily fortified defense lines the uh, Ukrainians constructed opposite Donetsk city, which, have, which the Russians have broken, broken through in. 
and he also spoke about heavy fighting in Bakhmut and in uh, Solidar. Now, I would say that some time ago, after the fall of Lysychansk, the Ukrainian government made the reckless promise to the Ukrainian people that Lysychansk would be the last town, Ukrainian town, to fall under Russian control. And um, Ukraine, the Ukrainian authorities have said many things over the course of this war, but this is one thing that they said which has caught a great deal of attention and which people in Ukraine appear to remember. So if Bakhmut, which is an important place, it's 70 plus thousand people before the war, if it falls, and of course if the important neighboring cities of Slavyansk and Kramatorsk fall, well, the credibility of the Ukrainian government will be severely damaged. And perhaps for that reason, we're now hearing reports that the Ukrainians are themselves pulling their troops back from Sivesk, this small town in the north, which they seem to have persuaded themselves would be the next target of the Russian attack after the fall of Lysychansk. They seem to be pulling their troops out of Sivesk, recognizing that Sivesk is actually a sideshow and that their troops stationed to defend Sivesk, or 20,000 of them, are not actually doing very much in the course of the battle. They're trying to pull them back towards Bakhmut, to defend Bakhmut from this Russian offensive. Whether those troops arrive there in time, what state they'll be in if they do arrive, whether, whether Ukraine is intending to pull all its troops out of Sivesk, or only some of them, these are matters which I cannot comment about. They remain to be seen. And there's also reports that the Ukrainians are now trying to rush artillery, heavy guns, back to the Donetsk front lines. If you remember, it's now, I think, universally acknowledged that the Ukrainian, uh, the reason the Ukrainian defences opposite Donetsk city crumbled was precisely because the Ukrainians found that they had withdrawn their artillery, their heavy artillery from places like Pesky to assist this great counteroffensive in Kherson region, which we've been hearing Ukraine talk about ever since March, and that this left the defense lines opposite Donetsk critically short of artillery and that was why the Russians were able to break through what was supposed to be the most dense and heavily fortified area of the Ukrainian defense lines in Donbass. The Ukrainians appear to be trying to return at least some of their artillery to Donetsk. Again, what shape it will be in when it gets there is of course an entirely different matter. Whilst on the topic of the offensive in Kherson region, we've been hearing that yesterday, uh, Sunday, was a day not of a Ukrainian offensive in Kherson region, which I speculated in my previous video might have been the case, but on the contrary of Russian attacks towards Likolaev and Russian attacks upon this Ukrainian force north of the Ingulets River, which is apparently trying to establish a, break, uh, a bridgehead across the Ingulets River in preparation for this offensive. And all the talk yesterday, all the focus in much of the media was on this battle in southwest Ukraine with lots of speculation that in fact the Russians were actually mounting an outright counteroffensive, and that they were advancing on Nikolaev and they were seeking to capture one of the villages that stands between their front lines and Nikolaev city itself. Nikolaev being of course this great port city um, on the uh, Black Sea, it's actually on uh, one of the rivers there but it's close to the estuary of the river um, on the Black Sea, it was an, 
it, there's an enormous Soviet era naval shipyard there, which once upon a time built Soviet aircraft carriers. It's now apparently lying idle. It's been lying idle for many years and is apparently in an extremely poor condition. Some say that it is essentially unusable. But one way or the other, Nikolaev is an important city and of course the Ukrainians would suffer a massive psychological blow if it were to fall to the Russians, especially in the very area where they've been relentlessly promising a counteroffensive for months now. And there's been increasing numbers of articles questioning whether this offensive, this Kherson counteroffensive, is even a viable option. There was a rather strange article in Forbes which said that Ukraine, it, that its uh, uh, tank forces are now stretched extremely thin, that uh, Ukraine has lost so many tanks and so many trained tank crew that it's finding it difficult to concentrate enough tank forces in enough parts of the various spread out front lines to be able to uh, uh, form an important, a decisive tank formation in any one particular place. And of course, if you're going to launch a tank advance towards Herson, you need, you're going to advance, you're going to launch an offensive towards Herson City, you need tanks to do it, especially over the open fields where infantry would be desperately vulnerable to attack from Russian aircraft and especially helicopters. So Ukraine needs armor and apparently it's critically short of it. Now this would not be an article in a Western media outlet if it didn't come up with some really rather strange claims, if it didn't say for example that Ukraine actually has uh, 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 more tanks than it's lost because it's captured tanks from the Russians and it's been supplied with tanks by the West. I'm going to say straight away that I think this is absurd, but even Forbes admits that Ukraine has lost most of its tank crews, and as a result, even with such tanks as it does have, it's not really in a position to carry out tank offensives. And I've noticed also, and this is something I've been commenting about, I think, on previous videos, that the British Ministry of Defence briefings, which has spent an enormous amount of time given highly coloured, highly biased towards Ukraine, if I have to be straightforward about it, accounts of the battlefield, has stopped providing battlefield reports of any significance. Its very latest report was a long one uh, uh, claiming that it was the Russians who were lay, laying all these anti-personnel mines in Donetsk, including, bizarrely, presumably in Donetsk city, though um, the British Ministry of Defence doesn't actually refer to Donetsk city specifically. And it's very critical of the Russians for doing that. Of course, the Russians claim, and have been claiming for a while, as the Bru Russians who first reported about all this mine laying with these anti-personnel butterfly mines. The Russians claim it's the Ukrainians who've been doing it. And whilst I'm on the subject of the British Ministry of Defence uh, reporting um, essentially Ukrainian versions of events without perhaps accepting that there might be another side to this story, the British Ministry of Defence and other Western outlets continue to report the shelling of the Zaporozhye nuclear power station, sometimes implying it's the Russians who are doing the shelling, sometimes, as in the case of the Guardian, try, the, the British newspaper, trying to avoid saying who is actually shelling the Zaporozhye nuclear power station. Now, since the Zaporozhye nuclear power station is firmly under Russian control, I would have thought that the only people who could be shelling it, who would have any conceivable motive to shell it, would be the Ukrainians. 
that there is an extraordinary, it's extraordinary to what lengths some people seem to go to deny the obvious. Anyway, that's where we are on the battlefields. The key front, as I said, remains for the moment Donbass. Um, once Bakhmut falls, once um, a Donetsk region is cleared, then I think all of these forces that the Russians have been gathering in all these other places in southwest Ukraine, near Kharkov, in Har uh, opposite Kharkov region in Russia itself, all of these forces will be activated and we will see a deep, an offensive deep into Ukraine's rear. But first, the Russians have to break these defense lines in Donbass, Don, Donetsk, these Ukrainian defense lines, and they seem to be making steady, incremental progress in doing so. Progress which, as Zelensky effectively admitted in that broadcast I've just mentioned, is causing the loss of many Ukrainian lives. Anyway, that's where we are, or so it seems to me, on the battlefields. This conflict is not merely limited to the battlefields. We've also had um, a major event happen, which is that summit meeting between President Putin of Russia and Turkish President Erdogan in the Russian resort city of Sochi. And there is, it seems, increasing Western alarm about this. And um, yesterday, the Financial Times had a very vivid uh, he headline. It was the lead story in the Financial Times, which reads, Alarm mounts in Western capitals over Turkey's deepening ties with Russia. The article is behind a paywall, but I will read some extracts from it. It says, Western capitals are increasingly alarmed at the deepening ties between Turkey's President Erdogan and Vladimir Putin, raising the prospect of punitive retaliation across against the NATO member if it helps Russia avoid sanctions. Six Western officials, six Western officials, told the Financial Times they were concerned about the pledge made by Turkish and Russian leaders to expand cooperation on trade and energy after the two had four-hour meeting in Sochi on Friday. One EU official said the 27-member bloc was monitoring Turkish-Russian relations more and more closely. When it, of course, talks about the 27-member bloc, it means certain countries within that bloc and, of course, the European Commission. A senior Western official also suggested countries could call on their companies and banks to pull out of Turkey if Erdogan follows through with the intentions he outlined on Friday, a highly unusual threat against a fellow NATO member state that could severely damage its already flat, fragile $800 billion economy. Three e European officials said the EU has not, had not yet held any official discussion about possible repercussions for Turkey. Several others cautioned that it was unclear what Erdogan and Putin had agreed and that a formal EU decision on sanctions on Tur against Turkey would be challenging given divisions on the matter inside the bloc. Even without an EU agreement, some member states could take action. For example, they could ask for restrictions on trade finance or ask the large financial companies to reduce finance to Turkish companies, one official said. I would not rule out any negative actions if Turkey gets too close to Russia, he added. I, find, I have to say, I find this all completely extraordinary. Turkey is still, to all inter to, you know, nominally speaking, a NATO ally. I think if the West <laughs> were to take steps like this, start to sanction Turkey to obstruct trade between Turkey and Russia, um, then, of course, 
they would in fact be widening their sanctions war to increase, include more and more third countries, and that would inevitably provoke massive pushback from around the world. After all, Turkey is not a member of the EU and is not therefore a party to the sanctions which the EU has itself imposed. Imposing sanctions like this on Turkey would, I think, astonish, would appall many people around the world if it were seen through. And I'm going to add further that um, taking a step like this would add to the blindness, the insensitivity to Turkish feeling, which is repeatedly shown by Western officials. Now, I have referred to this country, Turkey, by that name. So has the Financial Times. The Financial Times has ignored the fact that the official name of Turkey and the one that Turkey wants to be referred to by around the world is now Turkiye. The Russians are extremely careful. President Putin of Russia is extremely careful to refer to this country as Turkiye. I will henceforth refer to it as Turkiye in this broadcast. I did so because I was reading from an article on the Financial Times and I wanted for a while to continue with this pattern. Now this shows I think many Turkish officials, many members of the Turkish public will feel it shows insensitive insensitivity towards Turkish feeling to refer to their country as Turkey, continue to refer to their country as Turkey instead of Turkey and imposing sanctions upon it will add to the sense of outrage, it will persuade many Turkish people that what they have to put up with is not straightforward disrespect and disregard for feelings on behalf of the West, Western governments towards their country, Turkey, but also um, a sense that Turkey is a country that should be bullied, it should be treated as the bad child in the class that is put in detention, that is punished by the teacher for not doing as it's told. And I can't imagine that that's not going to have a severe impact on feeling in Turkey itself. And of course, if the West is determined to start imposing sanctions on Turkey because the Turks decide, as is their right, to continue trading relations with Russia. Notice that no part of the agreement that was reached between Erdogan and Putin seeks to undermine Western sanctions in any way. Um, if Turkish companies, for example, supply Russia, Russian companies with um, furniture products and textiles and things like that, the kind of products that are no longer be pro being provided by European companies, that doesn't actually undermine the sanctions, because the sanctions do not say that European companies should not provide these sort of products to Russian companies. Rather, European companies have been strong-armed to do it, in some cases against their wishes, as a result of enormous pressure brought to bear upon them by Western companies, Western governments, and of course, first and foremost, European governments, in no sense and in no way are the Turks undermining any official Western sanctions or European sanctions by trading with the Russians to replace these products that European countries companies are currently withholding. And the same applies, by the way, to uh, um, parts for um, Russian car companies. Not that I think Turkey is really in a, much of a position to provide those, but 
um, materials, for the building industries, um, for all these kind of industries that we've been talking about. There is no actual European sanctions against these supplies of these products. It's part of the economic war the West is waging that these products are not supplied. But technically and officially, they're not covered by the sanctions, just as the food, the, the pressure on Western companies not to deal in Russian food and oil products um, was also something that was Western companies were pressured to do unofficially. It was not, in fact, an ex an, um, an, um, it was not, in fact, required by the sanctions themselves. So that's where that's where we are. We are seeing Western Cup governments, European governments, threatening Turkey yet yeah, because this article in the Financial Times, headlined in that kind of way, is clearly intended, first and foremost, as a threat to Turkey. Yeah. Notice that it's based on leaks from six Western officials, European officials. Threats of sanctions against Turkey yeah, for conducting entirely legal, legitimate trading with Russia, which is not even covered by the sanctions. It's obviously a threat. And of course, if that threat is followed through with actual sanctions, on top of the disrespect that I've previously discussed, it's going to be, I suspect, for many people in, Tur in Turkey, many P Turkish people, the last straw. And at that point, the last the issue, the thing I never, I've always discounted that the Turks, Erdogan would do, the possibility of Turkey quitting NATO suddenly becomes real. Now, I'm going to make a guess. I suspect that there are some people in Europe who would not be sorry to see that. I think that there are quite a few people in Europe who basically do not regard Turkey as a Western country in any shape or form, see Turkey's membership of NATO as an anomaly. They've been blocking its entry into the European Union for as long as I can remember, and they would not be sorry to see Turkey leave NATO. But of course, from the perspective of NATO's military strategists, this would be a disaster. It would be a far bigger loss than could be compensated by the gain of uh, Finland and Sweden, two relatively small countries in population terms. Turkey is a big country in population terms. And of course, Turkey also, through the Dardanelles, holds the key to the Mediterranean and the Black Sea. The Russian fleet, the Russian Navy, in the Black Sea has issues patrolling the Mediterranean from the Black Sea because the Dardanelles, the Straits, are ultimately controlled by Turkey, a NATO member state. And conversely, Western governments, Western navies can only enter the Black Sea because Turkey lets them do so through the Straits because it is, of course, a NATO member state. If Turkey were to realign with the Eurasian powers, then of course that calculus might change. The Russians might have an incentive to build up their fleet in the Black Sea to a much greater extent than they're doing at the moment. So far the Black Sea net fleet is one of the less important fleets in the Russian Navy. The two key fleets are the Northern Fleet in the, uh, in the northwest Arctic, um, covering the North Sea, and of course the Pacific Fleet, based in Vladivostok. Um, the Black Sea Fleet, the Russian Black Sea Fleet, has up to now tended to be the least, one of the less important of the four Russian fleets. But if the Russians had confidence in unrestricted access 
to the Mediterranean through the Black Sea, well, they might that might change. The Russians might start to build up their Black Sea fleet in the knowledge that in the event of a conflict, they would be able to deploy it in the Eastern Mediterranean. And in that case, with as I've discussed on previous videos, with Russia already now having a very powerful combined naval and air base in the Tartus area of Syria, Syria the Tartus Latakia area of Syria, um, at, with the Russians able to use that base to support their fleet passing from the Black Sea through the Turkish Straits into the Eastern Mediterranean. One would have to say that NATO's up to now almost unchallenged control of the Eastern Mediterranean would become contested for the first time seriously since the end of the Second World War. And indeed, I am far from confident that NATO would not be comprehensively outmatched by the Russians in the Eastern Mediterranean. The Russians, of course, would in that case be operating much closer to their main bases in Sevastopol and Novorossiysk and elsewhere than the US Navy would be, uh, which would obviously be operating in the Mediterranean, far from its main bases in the continental United States. Anyway, so I think the pressure on Turkey would be an act of extraordinary folly. Turkey it would be an extraordinary folly. And yet, that's what we see being threatened in the Financial Times now. Now, this comes on top of the crisis in Taiwan, with the Chinese now effectively blockading Taiwan, and talking about blockading Taiwan from this point on, on a regular basis. And this is a pattern of the West picking fights constantly with all kinds of countries all at the same time and losing them, <laughs> losing all of them. Frederick the Great, the great Prussian general and king, once said that if you try to defend everything, you defend nothing. His point was that you can't be strong everywhere at once. And yet that seems to be what some people in the West think. There has even been an article in the Washington Post which says that the United States can take on China and Russia at the same time. The conventional wisdom on this supposedly is wrong. Well, I, th that premise, that theory, is being tested now to destruction. Personally, I think that is a reckless idea, the idea that you can take on the Chinese and the Russians at one and the same time. But if you're going to add to that number, Turkey, Iran, North Korea as well, well, you're very, very soon going to find yourself facing a commitments crisis, the like of which it's impossible to imagine. However, that's the drift. That seems to be what people in the West, some people in the West, want to see. We see that they've mismanaged affairs in Ukraine to the point where there's a war there, a war which the West's ally, Ukraine, is now progressively losing. We see that they've mismanaged the whole situation in Taiwan, which is now being blockaded. And now we see threats of sanctions against Turkey, which will only compound those problems, even as war drums have been beating about a possible Israeli strike on Iran. Well, we certainly do live in very interesting times. I think that on the Turkey issue, for the time being, the wiser councils will prevail, but I do wonder for how long. Anyway, there we are. A certain Austrian gentleman who um, was running things in Germany in the 1930s and 40s, whose name, of course, we can't really mention on our programs and the Duran, 
YouTube doesn't like us doing so. He, of course, did exactly what I am discussing now. He took on far too many enemies all at once. He landed Germany in a massive commitments crisis. He never finished a war before he started another one. It seems we're intending to repeat that mistake. It didn't end well for him. I can't imagine that it will end well for us, but that seems to be what we are in the process of doing. Well, thank you. That's my program for the day. Um, as I said, I'll continue to the extent that I can, uh, sending you more programs um, here from Greece whilst I'm here. Have a very good day until then. Remember, you can catch us up. If you can't, you're having trouble on finding us on YouTube or if you want just to go and check us out on other platforms, you can find us on Locals, on Rumble, on Telegram and on Odyssey. You can support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar. You can also check out uh, um, our shop and find the amazing things that you can find there, our magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our sweatshirts, our t-shirts and all the rest. And in the meantime, um, please remember also to check your subscription to this channel. Tick the like button if you like this video. And may I take this opportunity again. Thank you for joining me today. And to look forward to you joining me again soon. And to wish you a very good day. Until then.